to what these United States supposed to stand for. And the world at large is not better. As I said last week, there are various theaters of war ongoing as we speak throughout the world. It has been this way, it continues to be this way. It's to a degree where we ask ourselves, what are we supposed to do? The good thing is, as believers, God has not left us without instructions, without clear guidelines, so we don't have any reason to panic. You and I, if you believe in the Lord, when we see all this division, all the craziness in the world, we need to maintain an attitude of stillness. Be at peace. What other people see as craziness, we need to see them as opportunities. When you see the world doing the things that they're doing, pushing forth those things they're pushing forth, like Walt reminded us, even taking the thing like the Last Supper and just turning it around so that they can bring into it a blasphemous understanding, he tells you that the world more than ever, needs the message of Jesus Christ. Now, one of the key indicators that the Bible is indeed God's word, or at the very least, a document that is mysterious enough so as to cause others to pause and consider its message, it is the, the many prophecies that are made in the Bible that have in actuality been fulfilled. What is a prophecy? A prophecy is a, a message that has been communicated to a prophet by God concerning events that have been happened yet. Now, prophecies take different forms and shape. Some prophecies contain more immediate warning. For example, there are a lot of prophecies that God kept sending his people Israel to get them to shape up, get in order before I come with judgment. But there are prophecies that were specific to the person of Jesus Christ. His coming, his death, his resurrection. And we'll look at some of those in a moment. Biblical prophecy has several distinct characteristics that causes it to be different from just someone that is making a prediction, or guesses, or analysis. Nowadays, you hear all the time, there's prophet so-and-so who's saying this and that. I remember many, many years ago, I was in school in Miami, and someone invited me to a, a meeting that they were having at their home. There was a, a prophet so-and-so who was going to to come. I was friend with the person, so I, I went for their sake. As we sat there, the man came out and he started a spill about the meaning of the number seven. There is a meaning to it, but he was just throwing that out there. And for some reason, he, he chose me to, to prophesy on. <laughs> and he was telling me that he's seeing me and 
in, in, in board meetings, that I am going to rise, that I'll be recognized. And at the time, I, I used to work for a company that used to do board meetings, B-O-R-D, and to me, they were board, B-O-R-E-D, meetings. I hated them. So that prophecy just totally missed me. <laughs> Bible prophecy is different. There are two characteristics, they're much more than that, but two characteristics that make them stand apart are the following. Number one, the message being delivered, it comes directly from God and not from the prophet's own imagination. Second Peter 1, 21 says, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It is not someone that just, just throwing different things out there. Oh, I, I think I see a, 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 an image, it's a man looks orange, there's a gunshot, you know, no. A prophet will tell you very clearly, very specifically, that an event is going to happen to a specific person and exactly what's going to happen because what? They're getting it from God directly. Secondly, because they are getting it from God directly, the message being delivered it has a 100% guarantee of taking place. 100%. God ties a core characteristic of his personality to that fact. In Isaiah 46, God is speaking to Israel and letting, him know, letting them know what he plans to do to the false gods of Babylon and ultimately for Israel. And he says this of himself. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient time, what is still to come. And I say, my purpose will sin and I will do all that I please. And that is why I titled the message, God's Purpose Stands. God calls the end from the beginning. He knows the future before it comes to pass. Now there are some philosophical dilemmas that come from that. There are many who says, well, if God knows the future, does that mean he is causing everything that happens? And there are questions that come as far as, is there such thing as free will? Is everything controlled by God? And so on and so forth. That is not the scope of the sermon, so I'm not going to get into that very much. But let's say this. God, knowing the future, does not absolve us of responsibility of our own actions. The message being delivered, as we say, it has that 100% guarantee because the source of the message, God, he never get things wrong. I said it here before, jokingly, uh, in past sermon, I say, you know you're in trouble if you ever hear God say, oops. It's not a good sign. The message being delivered comes directly from God and not from the prophet's own imagination. If the prophet gets anything wrong, even an iota wrong, you will know that it is not from God. God clarifies that in Deuteronomy chapter 18. In Deuteronomy 18, God is giving instructions about provisions that needs to be made for the priests and the Levites. 
that they're not to inherit the land just like the other tribes, that they're supposed to live off the offerings that are made to the Lord. He's talking to them about specific portion of the sacrificial animals and the first fruit, the grain, the, the wine, and the oil, the things that are supposed to be given to the priest for the service. And he goes on to tell them about the things that he wants to make sure they're not doing. He wants them not to imitate the practices of these people, the Canaanite, that is sending them to take over. He calls what they do detestable. He lists some of these practices. He says to them, don't sacrifice your son and daughter in the fire. Don't practice divination, sorcery, fortune telling, witchcraft, casting spells, holding seances, you know, just kind of like calling the dead so you can have this channeling session. He says, do not do any of these things. We need to understand that if God says not to do something, that thing he's telling you not to do is actually something that can be done. All of these practices were actual practices that were real. And part of the reason God is saying not to do them is because in these practices, you enter into connection and relation with demonic spirit. And demonic spirits have only one goal. It is to confuse, destroy, take over, and totally remove you from your place in God's presence. Now, in that same chapter in Deuteronomy 18, God tells them he will send them a prophet like Moses who will speak to them on his behalf. And then God asks the question himself. And he says, how will you know that I have actually sent that person? Well, God says, if what a prophet spoke in my name doesn't happen, if what the prophet says does not come to pass just like they said, then you will know it wasn't from me. And that's how we can know whether a prophecy is from the Lord or not. There have been many throughout history who have claimed to be prophets, and they made various predictions, and they were proven to be false. Harold Kemping is one of them. In 2011, he predicted in that May 21st, 2011, would be when the end of the world would take place. He had many followers, and they prepared for that. Well, the date came, and it didn't happen, so he revised his prediction. Well, there's a little glitch. I didn't mean May 21st, I meant October 21st. Clearly, we're still here. It didn't happen. William Miller, another one that had major following, he predicted that the second coming of Christ would happen on October 22nd, 1844. We are in what? July 2024. He missed it. Elizabeth Clare Prophet. She was the founder of the Church Universal and Triumphant. She predicted that a nuclear war would happen in the 90s. And all her followers, they started building fallout shelters to prepare for what was coming. And here we are. Still hasn't happened. Unlike these false prophets, the Bible has the proven track record. When a prophet was getting ready to speak 
on God's behalf, they usually started the message by saying, thus says the Lord. Or this is what the Lord God says. It was a way to authenticate the message that they were going to share. Now that is not to say that those who came also with false prophecies, they don't use the same language. Of course they do. The intent is to deceive and manipulate. They will say, this is what the Lord said to me. I saw this in a vision. God spoke to me. But again, the validation comes in seeing if what was spoken has come to pass. Now, there are many prophecies in the Bible about the Lord Jesus, about the nation Israel, about the return of Christ, into Christ, the rapture, the end times, and so on and so forth. Many, many prophecies. Now, because of doctrinal differences, not all Christians agree on the fulfillment of these very prophetic words. Some say certain things you see is not what you think it is. There are divisions. It is something very interesting to me that there are many who are Bible believers, for example, who believe that the nation of Israel has no prophetic meaning. That they are just purely an accident, if you will, of history. I beg to differ because I believe the text, and we'll see some of it today, shows something different. But very quickly, let's take a look at some of the prophecies about Jesus that have been fulfilled because they will give us an example so we can look at and see when were these predictions made, how long it took for them to be fulfilled, and how they were fulfilled. First, let's look at some that talk about the birth of Jesus Christ. Turn to me, if you will, in Isaiah 7, verse 14. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Imagine the time of Isaiah is writing this, and someone is reading, the virgin will give birth? What are you talking about? What are you on? 700 to 730 years later, what happened? The very thing that he predicted would happen. Mary gave birth to Jesus. He wrote it at least 700 to 730 years before it happened. In Micah 5 verse 2, it's okay if you don't turn to this, I'll read them for you. Micah 5 2. It says, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Now, this is talking about where Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, predicted 700 to 750 years before it happened. And where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. We sing it today. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. And so on and so forth. Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. We read these words. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captive and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Now, in Luke chapter 4, we have this very beautiful scenery where Jesus goes into the synagogue. He takes the scroll, which is the Bible of that day. He opens it up to that very passage we just read, Isaiah 61. And he reads it. He reads it up to the section where he says, he's here to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. After he finished reading it up to that point, he stopped, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and then he tells them that today the scripture is fulfilled in your eyes. He announces himself. He's saying, this is about me, and today it is fulfilled. So we can consider that to be a par partially fulfilled prophecy. The reason it's partial is because there's a second section, the, the remainder, where it says, the day of vengeance of our God is still coming. That still hasn't happened yet. Jesus came. He brought to us the year of the Lord's favor. Think of the time frame that we've been living in. Since Jesus came and died and came back to life as a year of God's patience. It's a time frame of God's favor. God has opened it wide for everyone who wishes to be saved to come and take of the water of life. It is God's grace, God's mercy. He wants all to come. And that's been the time that we in. But this time also will eventually come to a close. Because God is not blind to the many injustices and sin that are taking place in the world. And a day of judgment is prophesied and it is coming. We read about prediction that talks about the betrayal of Jesus. Psalm 41.9, even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. A reference to Judas betraying Jesus. But to make it even clearer, in Zechariah 11, verse 12 to 13, we read this. I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay. But if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter the handsome price at which they valued me. So I threw the 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the potter at the house of the Lord. This was the amount that Judas got for betraying Jesus, 30 pieces of silver. And it goes on. In your notes, I mentioned his crucifixion. Psalm 22, Jesus is on the cross. What does he say at some point? He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, the reference for that is from, from Psalm 22. Psalm 22, the section says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. This is about the crucifixion of Jesus. 
written 1,030 years before its fulfillment. And that just to name a few. I intended to cover more, but for the sake of time, I'll skip forward. The point is this. The Bible has proven itself to be reliable. It has shown us that what God truly says he will, come, he will bring to pass, those things come to pass. He predicts the future with absolute clarity and certainty, not missing a beat. Now, the area of controversy that I just mentioned earlier, when I said not all believers believe, for example, that the nation of Israel is part of prophecy. What is interesting about that is many of those who reject that, they don't take issue with the prophecies about Jesus. They'll accept these as being actual prophecy that came to pass. What happened is a lot of time is there's a section of the prophetic word that is spiritualized. Different meaning is given to it instead of an expectation that it will happen in actuality in the exact same way those things about Jesus happen that these other prophecies they'll also take place in the same way. Turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11. What I like about that passage is the fact that it blends together Prophecies about Jesus and about Israel in one whole section. I listed from verse 10, but I'm going to start from verse 1 on down just so we can see the whole context. In verse 1, it says, it starts by saying, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and strength, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. Now, who it is that came from Jesse? Jesse, we know, is the father of King David. Jesus is that branch that came from the line of David. And the spirit of the Lord was on Jesus. Remember at his baptism, the spirit came. Now, it talks about the spirit of wisdom and understanding, knowledge, the fear of the Lord. Seven characteristics are given. Theologians refer to those as the, the sevenfold spirit or the seven characteristics of the Holy Spirit. That Jesus had the spirit. And when he came, he came to do his father's will. He moved in the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Now this is something we know that has been fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. But he talks about how he will not judge by what his eyes see. That he will judge with righteousness. He will judge the, the poor. And decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. It's that theme again of, of judgment. That he is coming to set things right. 
We continue with that because he says, And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. These are characteristics of Christ, faithful and righteous. It is still a future prophecy because it's talking about Jesus' second coming to judge the earth and rid it of wickedness. This imagery, we see it repeated for us again in Revelation 19. When he's saying that he's going to destroy things with the breath of his mouth. Let me read Revelation 19, 15 to 16. He says of this, of this, of Jesus. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the white winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. we told as we continue reading that same passage in Isaiah 11, and the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young, the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. Beautiful imagery. Also the cow and the bear will graze, the young will lie together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hands on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Then in that day, the nation will resort to the root of Jesse, Jesus Christ, who will stand as a signal for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. Now we know this has not yet been fulfilled. Please don't take your kids and put them by the cobra and the vipers then. Not going to end well. This is a depiction of what the earth will be like during the rule of Jesus Christ on earth. It shows the world at peace, nature at peace, the animal kingdom and humanity interacting with each other in a peaceful way. We told the Lord's mountain there will be no unrighteousness, it's just going to be peace. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Now, the reason I said this passage is interesting, because up to this point, I think everyone would be in agreement. But then it transitioned and started talking more about Israel. And this is what it says. Then it will happen on that day, that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he will lift up a standard for the nations. And he will assemble the banished ones of Israel, and he will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Then the jealousy of Ephraim will depart, and those who harass Judah will be cut off. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, and Judah will not harass Ephraim. Then he transitioned to warfare language. They will swoop down on the slope of the Philistines on the west 
Together, they will plunder the sons of the east. They will possess Edom and Moab. And the sons of Ammon will be subject to them. And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt. And he will wave his hand over the river with a scorching wind. And he will strike it into the seven streams. The river is a uh, reference to the Euphrates River. And it will make men walk over it. It says dry shod, but some translations say in sandals. And there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant of his people who will be left just as there was for Israel. In that day that they came up out of the land of Egypt. Let us deconstruct this a little bit. This is something that hasn't taken place yet. It concerns events that are tied to a group of people that God says he will gather from the four corners of the earth. Now, the reason that this interpretation is consistent with the nation of Israel are the following. First of all, it's speaking about a specific geographical location. It talks about Israel as the main point of reference, and it mentioned various nations and their relationship with it. Jesus says, I will again recover the second time with my hand, the remnant of my people. Now, some of the countries that were mentioned in that passage, let me give you the, the modern equivalent of these countries. Assyria, we're talking about northern Iraq, northeastern Syria, Turkey, Iran, all these countries were Assyria, but today they different countries. What do these countries have in common? They are enemies with Israel. Egypt, we know Egypt, it still has the same name. Pathros, still part of Egypt. Cush, that's Sudan. Elam, Iran. Shinar, part of Iraq. Hamath, Syria. The islands of the sea refers to Greece and some people think some of the European territories. Now the passage describes specific location of conflicts. Where it says they will do what? They will swoop down on the slope of the Philistines on the west. That section is the section today that is referred to as the Gaza Strip. It says they will possess Edom and Moab, and the sons of Ammon will be subject to them. Well, Edom, Moab, and Ammon today make up the country you and I know as Jordan. Why is this significant? Well, it hasn't happened yet in history. Since it hasn't happened yet in history, in that exact same way, that means it's still a prophecy waiting to happen. We've said and we've looked at the fact that what? God has a 100% accuracy in his prophecies. So if he says it, it will eventually come to pass. Now, God speaks of gathering the people a second time. Some people think that is a reference to when they came from captivity from Babylon. But it cannot be that because that captivity, it was from a specific location. They came from Babylon. 
The regathering that he's talking about, he's saying he's coming from the four corners of the earth. Now, he mentions Ephraim and Judah coming together again as one. Remember that Israel became what? Divided. As you look at these prophecies, what is important to keep in mind is it's not just one section that says it. Isaiah will say it. And then you go in Ezekiel and others, and they seem to be repeating the same theme. Why? Well, they're getting the information from the same source, God Almighty. In Ezekiel 37, 19, for example, we read this. I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel associated with him, and I will put them together with the stick of Judah, and I will make them into a single stick, and they will become one in my hand. Eventually, God is going to bring back Israel as one. He will find all of them, he knows where they are, and bring them together as one. Now, many, as I said, don't believe that the nation of Israel currently is prophetic. But I believe scripture shows that it's a clear example of fulfilled biblical prophecy. Now, the concern that exists sometimes is this. Since it is fulfilled prophecy, does that mean we go and we sign on the dotted line over everything that Israel does? Not at all. You're a thinking person. You pay attention to right and wrong. If something is right, it's right. If it's wrong, it's wrong. What it means, however, is that you must not allow yourself to be influenced by propaganda that is used in politics, in media, in other areas to make up your mind. Because these events, they are prophetic. So that means God has a buy-in into these things. So we need to understand them from his point of view, from his perspective. Here's what God says about Israel. In Ezekiel 36, God is explaining the reason he's going to bring them back. And he says something very interesting. He says, I'm going to do this not because you are good, not because you are great. It's actually the opposite. God is saying, you've given me a bad name. Because you among the nations, the stuff that you're doing, because you're not coming back to me, it's making me look bad. God says, I'm going to bring you back for my own name's sake. Let me read that section for you very quickly. I dispersed them among the nations, and they were scattered through the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their actions. And wherever they went among the nation, they profaned my holy name. For it was said of them, these are the Lord's people. And yet, they had to leave his land. I had concern for my holy name, which the people of Israel profaned among the nation where they had gone. Therefore, say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things. But for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nation where you have gone, I will show the holiness 
of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations. The name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord. When I am proved holy through you before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. The majority of Israel today is secular. They don't believe in God. They definitely hate Jesus. Part of it is the Christian are to blame, historically, part of it. But overall, they're not embracing their God, their Messiah. God is saying, I'm going to bring you back. And since he says he's going to bring them back, and eventually he's going to do something to what? Cleanse their heart. Bring them to that place they recognize them. That means that they're coming back at this point. It's not a coming back where they, they're in belief. But there are several prophecies that lays out that God is going to work things out throughout history with the political situation, with what you see happening, eventually they're going to face a situation where they will have no choice but to look back on their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the lens through which we need to look at the political situations of the world that is taking place. This is not checkers, but chess that is being played. God is in the details, so is Satan. You and I, we need to be encouraged by these things because by seeing that the flow of prophecy connects directly to God, where he shows that he is sovereignly in control of all of it. He gives us encouragement to be encouraged in our spirit by where we stand. We do not have to fear. No matter how crazy it gets, do not fear. Your God is in control. Today we are going to have this baptism. They represent individuals who have come to faith, who have opened their hearts to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. It is the most important decision of anyone's life because that decision is it gives you the certainty that now I am in the Lord it does not mean that you're never going to face difficulties it does not mean that you're never going to face hardship but it means that when they come you have a strong tower that you can rely on. You can bring all your problems to the Lord. And he is what? Faithful. Let us bring this understanding about the Lord to all these things. Prophecy exists to give us not just an understanding of the future, hope for what is coming, but it gives us assurance. 
in the here and the now. Embrace the Lord with all your heart, without reservation. There's nothing greater, nothing better in this life. May God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, mighty God, hmm, we are so undeserving of your grace, of your mercy. I know without a doubt that everyone here has one thing in common. They all have sin. None of them are perfect. It is because of that, God, that we need you as our Savior. Thank you for helping us to understand that as we see events taking place in the world, we don't have to be afraid like everybody else. Give us wisdom, O oh God, to understand these things. Let us be willing, God, when we read your word to not be stuck with any paradigm that we've had. But wherever the scripture leads, let us be willing to go there. These dear brothers and sisters that, that are going to get baptized, I just pray, God, that you, you will bless their lives. Fill them, God, with your spirit. Guide every step that they take. Turn things around, God, for them. And if there's anyone here, God, who have not yet accepted you as their personal Savior, I pray that this word will touch them and cause them to come to faith. Thank you for all that you do, for all you've done and all you'll continue to do. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.